Hi, I'm Ken Akuda, and this is Look. Look is a new weekly program from the Smithsonian about Asian Pacific American life and culture. Why look? Because the APA community merits a closer look. There are over 12 million Americans whose ancestors come from a vast stretch of the planet, from the Himalayas to the Hawaiian Islands. A few have just arrived. Others have families that have been here for centuries. They brought lots of ideas and customs that have become part of the American culture. As for me, I was born in Korea, grew up in Japan, and came here when I was 14. But I'm 100% American. Like many APAs, I've left my own stamp on American culture. 20 years ago, I brought the Wacky Wall Walker from Japan to America. Today, the Wacky Wall Walker is in the Smithsonian along with other all-American toys like the Hula Hoop and the Slinky. Each week, Look will cover fascinating people and trends in the rich cross-current between East and West. I'm at the Isamu Noguchi Museum in Long Island City, New York. Noguchi was the son of a Japanese father and Caucasian mother who fused East and West in his art. Look closely. His work has a sense of calm and yet unmistakable power. Across the United States, Asian Americans are finding ways to honor their heritage. Take a look. Asian engineers have been improving and refining Western technology since the transistor radio. So maybe it's no surprise that a Korean American artist found a way to take video technology and turn it into art. This is a glimpse of a video landscape of tomorrow. Nantrim Pike was in the vanguard of one of the most important, if not the key development in 20th century art, and that is the impact of the moving image. It's very really hard to find unbeaten track, and when I find unbeaten track, I just uh, look around and it's more interesting. Nam June plays a crucial role of transforming television into truly an artist's medium. The George Washington of Video Art. Nam June Pike is a truly global artist, and I think that his life and his career really define that idea. Because I am a poor man from poor countries, so I have to entertain people every second. He was born in Seoul, Korea. He had a very early interest in compositions, and he pursued his studies at the University in Tokyo in Western music, modernism, and composition. Then he came to Germany, which is the center of new music. West. And there he was to meet artists who were to give him the opportunity to expand his thinking. Nam Jun Pike was part of Fluxus, which was one of the major avant-garde movements, and he was part of concerts that happened throughout Europe. He'd jump around the stage and throw things in the air and tip over pianos. He was changing how we heard, saw, performance, and music. The transition from music to video began in Germany. He took 
the television and distorted the received broadcast image, making a new kind of instrument out of the television set. It was his movement from Europe to New York that set the stage for his truly global impact. No better stage for that than New York City. I tell you why New York made me maximal, I don't know. I was more minimal in Germany. Global Groove in 1973 was a celebration of global culture through global television. It was like an encyclopedia of how to work with the moving image. More? Central to Nam Chun Pike's art, this is playfulness. That idea of turning things inside out. Playfulness, humor, jokes as a way to subvert reality, as a way to uh, turn institutions inside out. Right you are, right on. Never take yourself too seriously. He began this extraordinary partnership with Charlotte Mormon. I went to Juilliard, I studied with the great Leonard Rose, but I met Nam June Pike. He made for her the TV cello, one of his most celebrated works. And his TV bra for living sculpture that she would wear in her performances. So it's the real Bubachu. And Charlotte called the TV cello the first advance in the cellos in 1600, which I think is quite wonderful. Today, he is older, in his 70s, and is reflecting a lot on his past and thinking about his art of the future. Meta 11 created recently in his Green Street studio, is a piece that uses some of his old images in a new format to reflect on New York, which has been at the center of his life and art. And that's the gift that Nam June gave us. He took that video camera and he said, by looking through it, I can change what one sees. And I can take that television, which is just this instrument in the home receiving information, I can remake it into something that can give us a whole new way of seeing the world, a whole new way of seeing art. Like other artists, APAs put themselves into their creative expression. Does that make their art Asian, American, APA? I think I have been sort of asking myself, well, you know, who am I? Every day, one struggles to relook at this question of identity. I'm David Henry Huang, and I'm um, a Chinese-American playwright, screenwriter, and opera librettist. I'm basically a writer. That's what I do. I've struggled over the years with this question of being called an Asian-American writer. Sometimes I've felt it's a really great thing, there's sometimes I've felt it's a restricting thing. And now I kind of just think it's true. I mean, I am a writer, and I am an Asian-American. And that doesn't necessarily mean that all the subjects that I deal with will be Asian American, but in fact a lot of them are. And certainly everything is influenced by who I am, which includes being an Asian American. When I was a kid, I actually didn't think about my ethnicity very much at all. Um, I grew up in a pretty multi-ethnic neighborhood, and I kind of thought that being Chinese was like having red hair. You know, it's a, an interesting um, characteristic, but didn't have any further significance. Since most of us who grow up in America have a sense of ourselves as Americans, it's very disconcerting when other people perceive us as coming from someplace else. I look this way, I have these features. People meeting me for the first time might assume I wasn't born here. They might assume any number of things, some of which are fairly benign and some of which can be kind of harmful.
A lot of times that's just, you know, kind of irritating, like when people go, oh, you speak really good English. When I think about my parents and myself in relation to the images of Asians that we saw in film and television and mainstream American culture, those people looked like us, but they didn't seem to represent us. They didn't seem to have anything to do with the way that we felt uh, inside um, because they were either all good or all evil, but they weren't human beings. Now I become a parent, and I have Eurasian children, and you know the the, the, the pedal meets the metal in terms of well, what's how, how am I going to relate with my kids on some of these issues? I sort of discovered my Asian Americanness, as it were, by uh, deciding to become a writer. I wanted to write plays, and but didn't necessarily know I was going to deal with Asian American subjects, and yet as I started writing and learning to write more from my unconscious, a lot of these issues started appearing on the page. M. Butterfly is based on the true story of a French diplomat who had a 20-year affair with a Chinese actress who turned out to be A, a spy, and B, a man in drag. And the diplomat claimed that he never knew the true gender of his lover. In the play, I tried to kind of conflate the um, events of the spy story with the plot of the opera, Madame Butterfly. And Madame Butterfly, I think of as the mother of all Asian stereotype templates. My play's about exploring the emasculation of Asian men and the kind of hyper-feminization of Asian women and of the East in general. It has also been accused of perpetuating those stereotypes. And, you know, I, I have to concede, I mean, it's a three-act play, and for two acts of the play, there's a guy in a dress. So, you, you know, you can, you can make that argument. Um, but, of course, I, I like to think I've done it in the service of exploding that myth rather than uh, uh, perpetuating it. Finishes his drink. Lights. I sort of have a, a very multifaceted career nowadays. I do plays of my own. I do, you know, Broadway musicals and operas and movies and just about anything that involves scripts. You know, when Disney called me up about doing Aida, I really struggled with it for the whole thing for a while and what it all mean and, you know, selling out and all these kinds of issues. Um, let's not do this. We sent Abraham Ultimately, I felt, you know, there's something sort of cool about Disney looking at me not really as an Asian American writer, but as a writer, as somebody who had some skills that I could bring to their project. There's sort of two sides of that coin, that there's something comforting and seductive in being treated like that as well, or something safe. This whole issue of being mainstreamed, I mean, in, in, in some sense, that's authentic to the Asian American experience as well. Our relationship to the culture in general, it's a, it's a, it's a dynamic. Um, yes, the culture changes us, but hopefully we are also changing the culture. Look, I didn't go into this um, field thinking I was going to end up writing Disney musicals, but um, I don't know if that's, that's a bad thing. I mean, I think that's, again, part of a journey. That's my personal journey. And then the question becomes, all right, um, I'm someone who now works in a number of different fields and different types of subjects. So now who am I? And I think that's still an interesting question. Whether you're Asian Pacific American or just Asian in spirit, there'll be something you'll want to see each week. Join me, Ken Hakuda, as we explore the APA community in all its vibrancy and power on Look. Thank <laughs> you.